hello, I'd like to welcome you all to UWMC for the last bit of programming in the uh, affluenza shared reading program that we've had going on for about nine months at UW Marathon County. Um, all of this would not have been possible without several sponsors, which we'd like to thank, including uh, B.A. and Hester Greenheck Foundation, the Harvey Nelson Charitable Trust, Clyde F. Schluter Foundation, UW Colleges, UWMC Foundation, UWMC Student Life and Interest Committee, Wisconsin Humanities Council, Wisconsin Public Television, and North Central Health Protection Plan Fund of the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin. I'd also like to thank all the community members who've been supporting this program by your attendance and participation in the programming, and also students who've been um, participating both willingly and when coerced by faculty to, to participate. Um, our speaker this evening is Dr. John Foley, who is the director of the Center for State Sustainability and the Global Environment at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, Dr. Foley's research uses state-of-the-art computer models and satellite measurements to analyze changes in land use, ecosystems, climate, and freshwater resources across multiple spatial scales with the ultimate goal of understanding the interactions between complex environmental systems and human societies. Tonight, he'll be talking about living on a shrinking planet, challenges and opportunities for a sustainable future. So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Foley. Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, oh, this is probably too loud, isn't it? You're just, okay, we're good. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, being here this evening. I know it's a lovely night, so I appreciate you uh, sharing your time with me tonight. It's, uh, you know, I, I know I'd rather be in my garden tonight instead of listening to somebody like me. So, uh, so thanks for coming out. Um, well, it's really great to, um, it's kind of humbling to be uh, the last speaker in this series, uh, given some of the other folks you've been hearing from, like uh, Bill McKibben and Bill Reese and a number of other really, uh, really great national leaders and thinkers on this kind of issue. So it's really an honor to be here and be a part of this really special series we've put on. Um, what I'm going to try to do tonight is sort of engage you a little bit in some issues I know you've been thinking about a bit more, but try to you know, bring you along a bit with some ideas. Uh, maybe try to wrap up some things I'm just guessing that you've talked about this year related to this kind of you know, challenge of sustainability. The idea that you know, we have to really figure out how to run this ship at some point and learn how to do things a little bit more in the long term, a little bit more sustainably, and also address this challenge of you know, what I call kind of the shrinking planet. The fact that you know, we are becoming interdependent uh, with our biosphere in ways that uh, we've never been before, and it presents real challenges for us. So when we talk about the uh, kind of environmental and social challenges of sustainability in the 21st century, I think the best way to begin is probably to do something very, very rude to you all, and that is to, you know, um, whoops, is to make my slides work, there we go, is to curse the audience. Uh, this is the first thing you should never do, public speaking 101, never curse the audience, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, and you've heard this before probably, but this old ancient Chinese curse of may you live in interesting times. I would argue that we live in the most interesting and I think most hopeful, but also the most challenging time in all of human history. Now that's quite a statement when you think about it. You know, human history, if you believe the archaeologists or so, um, goes back at least 10,000 years. Uh, if you look at evolutionary biology, hominids have been on this planet maybe three to five million years. So why is it right now, just this moment, the beginning of the 21st century, so darn important? Hasn't every period of human history said the same thing? Well, I would argue this time is really special, is really important for a couple of unique reasons throughout all of our existence. One of them is from this photograph here, that we are the first generations of our species to ever take a truly planetary perspective. Since Sputnik, basically, since the late 50s, we have now live in a world that communicates globally, that visualizes ourselves on a single planet, that you know, we even travel in space to a limited degree. So this has given us a very different view of the world than almost any other generation could ever imagine, and now we take it kind of for granted. Now this has changed our outlook on the world. It's also changed the way we do science. Uh, this is, a, believe it or not, a forest. Those little green lumps are looking down at a forest from space. But as we step back, looking broader and broader, we see a landscape with rivers and forests and even clouds. We see it looks like kind of a river system emerging here. 
oh wait, a whole bunch of rivers, looks kind of like a delta forming here. Hmm, what is that? Oh wait, I think I know where that is. Hey, that's Eastern South America, right? That's the Amazon basin. That's a place I work quite a lot, right? Where we started actually. And we step back far enough and we see the whole planet. And for the first time in human existence, a single human retina can take in a whole planet. That to me is an incredible, incredible moment in human history and it's changed us forever. But another thing that's changed, of course, is our relationship to the planet. One of the things that's been extraordinary is how much things have changed in just the last 50 years or so and how that rate of change is increasing all the time. For example, if we look at the last 50 years, roughly, the last 50 years of the 20th century, we find that, yeah, human population has grown. Everybody likes to talk about population as an issue. Well, it's not the big issue, of course. Our economy grew far bigger than population. If you look at the goods and services traded on the planet uh, during that 50-year period, it went up sevenfold as opposed to population, which only, only doubled. So again, we have a huge increase in the number of people, but more importantly, how much stuff we use has gone up much, much more. Uh, we can look at it in terms of food and agriculture. For example, the uh, food consumption and food production on the planet roughly tripled during the last half of the 20th century, along with that, the use of water. Again, these are amazing numbers when you think of the long stretch of human history. We take everything before 1950 and then double it, triple it, and fold it by seven, outpacing all previous generations combined for thousands and thousands of years, and we do it in less than a human lifetime. And getting to the issue of climate change, which I'll talk about a lot, of course, is the issue of energy use. Again, compared to all previous generations, we just increase the use of energy fourfold, just in the form of fossil fuels, not even counting things like nuclear power and whatnot. So again, this is an amazing diagram when you think about it, or a set of data when you think about it, that this is a time that you know, we throw out all the scripts. There are no historical parallels to our moment in history at all. We're totally doing this without a script. So what does this mean? Well, one of the things that happened, of course, is that our planet has started to notice us. One of the ways it's noticed is through changes in the chemistry of our air. You've probably seen pictures like this before. This is showing the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Uh, this started to get measured uh, routinely in the late 1950s by a guy named Charles Keeling. And what we see here, of course, is these little wiggles going up and down. Those are natural. Those are, in fact, kind of like the planet breathing. Uh, when plants take in carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, CO2 goes down. And then in the wintertime, when CO2 is kind of released from plants and plants aren't really breathing in anymore, it comes back out and goes up in the winter. Uh, this is measured in Hawaii uh, in this particular chart, but it's measured all over the world. But as we can see, uh, along those wiggles, we see this long-term rise. And that's us. That's us burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, and so on, dumping it into the atmosphere. Now, the thing that's kind of amazing about this, if you step back, is that we change the chemistry of the air that we breathe everywhere in the world, even the chemistry of their oceans, it turns out, and we almost didn't notice it, and we did it entirely by accident. So changed an entire planet without noticing it for 100 years, and we didn't mean to. That's amazing. We've also done quite a few other things. There are other gases that have been changing, not only CO2, this other one called methane, Turns out these are both very, very powerful greenhouse gases, which I'll talk about in a second, but you've heard about before. And it leads us to this concern about global warming, this idea that our planet is warming up. Well, how does this work? Well, you've all heard it before, right? Unless you've lived in, maybe you've lived in some undisclosed location for about six years and never heard of this. Uh, you probably have. <laughs> so the idea here is very, very simple. It's just basic physics. And if you're going to tell me later, like, well, I'm not sure about this global warming stuff, I don't think it's real, then you don't believe in physics. It's that simple. And this is very simple stuff. It's not very hard to understand. The idea is that the sun's giving off solar radiation, stuff coming from the sun. Our atmosphere is basically transparent to sunlight, and it comes right in and warms the planet. But as Earth warms up, it gives off infrared radiation, a different form of radiation, longer wavelengths a cooler object than the sun, Earth isn't as hot. So in the infrared radiation, we give that off into the rest of the universe, into the rest of the solar system. But in the way of that infrared stuff is our atmosphere. And our atmosphere being full of water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and other gases, those absorb infrared radiation and re-radiate it back some of it down towards the surface, keeping the surface kind of toasty. Now one of the things that's really important to recognize is the greenhouse effect is a purely natural phenomenon. It's been here forever. 
we've had a very uh, strong natural greenhouse effect on this planet for four billion years. Not a big problem. In fact, without it, life on this planet probably would never have evolved. So when people tell you, well, don't worry about the greenhouse effect, it's natural. There's a little bit of truth to what they're saying. The point is, is that we're going to be adding to this greenhouse effect, making it much warmer than it is now, and doing it very rapidly. And other times when Earth's climate changed, it's usually been uh, associated with mass extinctions and really big, devastating things. So yeah, it's natural, but you know, so, is, so is extinction. Now that's something we don't really want. So climate change, yeah, part of it's natural, but part of it isn't, and part of it's going to bite us. We can also see the physics work on other planets. Here's Venus. We don't want to do that. That's bad. Oh, this is good. <laughs> okay. This is a really big greenhouse effect where it's actually 460 degrees Celsius on Venus. That would be about, what, 800 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, hot enough to melt lead. Partly it's closer to the sun, but partly Venus has a massive, massive greenhouse effect. And again, it follows exactly the conservation of energy, very basic physics that we know and love here on Earth. So it's very simple stuff. And the other thing about this is global warming is not a new idea. Some people seem to think that global warming was discovered by Al Gore in 2005, uh, just after he invented the internet. And uh, neither of those are true. Uh, but it turns out that these ideas go back to the 19th century, actually. Uh, some of you might remember this guy from your chemistry classes, Arrhenius, a uh, very famous uh, Swedish chemist. He wrote about global warming back in the 1880s. Being a good Swede, he thought it might be good for Sweden, actually, to warm it up a little. Uh, here in Wisconsin was this guy here, T.C. Chamberlain. He was a geology professor down in Madison. And then he went to become the university president uh, at the University of Chicago. So, and he wrote papers back in the 1890s, very good ones, in fact, about global warming. So the science of global warming has been known for about 120 years. Uh, Joseph Fourier, actually, was one of the first to write about it. So we've known this stuff for over a century. It's 19th century science playing out in the 21st century. So this is not new. This is not really rocket science. It's something we actually know pretty well, at least generally speaking. So what's the evidence? Is the planet really warming? And how much? What is it going to look like? Well, there's a lot of evidence. I can't go through all of it with you, but I can share a little. Here, for example, is an estimate of what our planet's temperature was for the last 1,000 years. We can go back further, but the further back we go, the murkier it gets. But here's an estimate of the temperature of the northern hemisphere starting about the year 1000 of our calendar, running until 2000, and that little red dot is 2005. So we go forward here, we see, well, there's some wiggling in here. There's certainly shifts in climate that are entirely natural that we didn't have anything to do with. But interestingly, something way outside the norm of what we've been seeing, what we saw was a slight cooling trend, actually. Uh, we're heading into, but not for 30,000 years, but we're slowly heading into another ice age, actually. So if anything, the natural shifts in climate should be cooling, not warming. But suddenly, about the 19, you know, starting around the late 1800s, we'd see a very large, very statistically significant, way outside anything we've ever seen before, totally nails it, warming right there, that. That's the thing we're so concerned about. Well, let's zoom in for the last 100 years. Here's showing that the Earth has warmed about 1 degree centigrade, roughly almost 2 degrees Fahrenheit, a little less, uh, just in the last 100 years. And you might say, well, 1 degree, come on, you know, quit screwing, you know, quit screwing around. I, mean, I can change the thermostat a degree, and I can't even notice it. What's 1 degree going to do for you? Well, this is 1 degree for the entire planet. And that means everything changes. It turns out during the last ice age, when this part of the state was, and Madison too, was well under a whole bunch of ice, during the last ice age, the planet on average was only three degrees colder than normal. We're already one degree warmer than normal from the planet average temperature. That, that begins to shift all of our weather patterns, it shifts ecosystems, it's a really big deal. It's kind of like you and I, when we have a slight, you know, one degree fever, is sort of noticeable. Three degree fever is a pretty big deal. It starts making you very sick. So a couple of degrees matter when the thing is really big. So this starts to matter. What about looking more recently? How about the 10 hottest years? What were the 10 hottest years? The 10 hottest years all occurred in the last 15. And the warmest yet was 2005. Second warmest is 2006. I haven't changed the slide yet. So again, Something's going on, and it seems to be accelerating, and it seems to be happening right now. We haven't been breaking a lot of cold records lately, I'll tell you that much, but a lot of warm records. We can also see evidence in nature. We can see it in our glaciers. For example, this little cartoon map shows areas of the world where glaciers are basically melting. 
Now, let me give you some ammunition here. A lot of people are so-called climate skeptics, people who like to tear holes in this idea of climate change. A couple of them will point out, and they're, they know better because they're, they're lying when they say this. They'll say, oh, well, in some parts of the world, glaciers are getting bigger, so much for global warming. Well, you guys know better because you live through cold winters just like me. In the wintertime when it's really cold, you know, it's so cold it can't snow anymore. You've heard that expression, too cold to snow, because the air is so cold it can't hold moisture. So let's go to the middle of Greenland or the middle of Antarctica, and it's 40 below, but now global warming has made it 35 below. What do you think is going to happen? Is stuff going to melt? No, of course not. It's still too cold. It's getting warmer, but it's still way below freezing, right? But the air is getting a little bit warmer, and actually it snows a little bit more than it used to. So ironically, global warming means in the interior, the very cold parts of Antarctica and Greenland, actually glaciers are getting a little bigger, and that's to be expected, okay? So when you hear, oh, some glaciers are getting bigger, so yeah, guess what? That's also proof of global warming in the right places. But everywhere else where warming temperatures get to above the melting point, they're melting, and they're melting fast. Uh, you've seen pictures like this before, probably, but here's one from a, a glacier in Alaska, photographed in 1941. Here's the Muir Glacier. Let's go to the same exact spot, same time of year. No tricks here. Same spot, same time of year. Look at it in 2004. Whoops, where'd it go? Well, let's go to the Toboggan Glacier, 1909. Same spot, same season, everything. Come back, 2004. Not only is the glacier gone, it's been replaced by forest. That's astonishing. This is a bigger change, rate of change than we've ever really seen before. This is amazing. Well, what about other kinds of indicators? What about sea ice, not land ice, but ice in the ocean, the Arctic Ocean? Remember the Arctic up there? That's an ocean, frozen ocean up there. And it turns out, since we've been having good measurements since the 70s, we've seen a steady decline in the amount of Arctic sea ice each and every decade. Well, let's look at a computer uh, movie of this. This is showing satellite measurements of sea ice around the Arctic. You might not make it out, but uh, this yellow line on the outside edge here, that's what it should be. That's the normal extent of sea ice about September of each year. That's kind of when the sea ice is at its minimum, and then it starts growing again in the fall and the winter. Well, this is 2005. We've lost already about a third of the sea ice cover of the Arctic. 2005 had the least amount of sea ice ever recorded in human history that we can record. 2006 was now in the second lowest year. So this is showing up there too. Well, what else is going on? We're seeing this in the plants and the animals. We're seeing, for example, this is a measurement of how long the growing season is between when things bud burst in the spring, when plants turn green, like about now, to when they senesce and turn brown in the fall. And it turns out throughout the Northern Hemisphere, measured by both satellites but also field work, um, Aldo Leopold and his, uh, his daughter actually published a paper together, kind of, on this uh, focusing on baraboo. But we're seeing also the length of the growing season getting longer and longer throughout much of the Northern Hemisphere. In much of that green area, in fact, are places where it's getting kind of longer growing seasons. Well, you might think at first, like, well, hey, that's a great thing, right? You know, summers are getting longer. Well, yeah, but that's also good for weeds. It's good for bugs. It's changing all of our agricultural practices, changing ecosystems, and it's doing it really fast. So this is a big deal, too. So global warming is not just confined to our thermometers. It's showing up in all of our natural world, and it's just beginning. So, you know, I could have gone on for a couple hours, if you want me to, about the evidence for climate change. And you know what? There is zero evidence, none, showing that this isn't happening. I mean, honestly, no scientist has been, I'll talk about this later, but there is no evidence showing any real scientific evidence saying that this is not happening yet. I'd love it if this weren't true, but it is, unfortunately. So despite all of this amazing evidence, it's just again and again and again and again, all pointing towards a warming planet, Despite that, at least in the United States, and mainly for very devious, very uh, hidden reasons, there's a widespread public set of myths about climate change that I think are, bit, well, not think, we know are been very deliberately foisted on the American people. But let me go through a few of these myths and help you shatter a few of them. The first one is, well, it's just a theory. I love this one. This is a pretty good one. You know, well, it's just a theory. Uh, this one's actually correct, but not for the reason people think. It's because people don't know what a theory is. Um, you know, this is actually correct. Um, a lot of people think theory is the kind of science code word for kind of a wild guess. Um, no, we use the word hypothesis when we want to say wild guess as scientists, you know, not theory. So hypothesis is when we just have a freaky idea, we don't really know. We put it out there and then we test it and test it again and test it again. Our, our peers test it, we put data to it, we do experiments, we make observations, we build models. 
And once anything tells you that hypothesis, this idea is wrong, you toss it out, get rid of it, start with a new one. A theory stands the test of time and fits all the data that we have. A theory is you know, solid. So yeah, there are lots of theories like you know, gravity, that's another theory, or the earth is round and it goes around the sun. Those are other theories, kind of like global warming. Uh, same could be said maybe for evolution too. You know, oh, it's just a theory. I'm like, yes, it is, you're right. Um, kind of like gravity, that's a good one too. So again, this is a theory, but that's not a bad thing. Well, one of the other ones I love, of course, is, well, the scientists aren't sure because, you know, I was listening to the radio the other day and there's this other guy saying that this is all a bunch of hogwash and he had a PhD, you know. They're giving those things away, okay? <laughs> Believe me, anybody can get a PhD nowadays. So, you know, talk radio should not be your source of scientific information, okay? So when you think about, you know, credentials of scientists or whatever, you know, you can get like, well, they got a PhD and they went to some big university. Well, big deal. Do they have any data? Do they actually put their idea, do they put their money where their mouth is, in other words? Do they put data alongside their ideas to back them up? Or are they just talking on talk radio or something? Well, this is pretty interesting because this is absolutely not true. In public media in the United States, there are 50% of the interviews have somebody who's skeptical of global warming and about 50% of somebody who is not skeptical of it. But if you go into the scientific literature where you have to put data with your paper, you have to say, here's my evidence to back up my wild claim. Well, when you do that, you can go through all the scientific papers published in the last five years, for example, sample a bunch of those. This, this study actually did that and found there were 928 papers talking about global warming. Of those, 928 of them said there was evidence for humans changing the climate and making it warmer. There were zero peer-reviewed articles with data that could say people were not changing the climate. So the score in the real scientific world is 928 to zero. And yet, on TV and on the radio, it sounds like it's sort of a 50-50 thing. It ain't 50-50 at all. Now, that doesn't mean it's right. I mean, Galileo was against a bunch of other people, Einstein and so on. I mean, it's not that science should be done by popularity contest, but they don't have any evidence at all. Zilch. They just have a lot of hot air. Well, no pun intended. Uh, <clears throat> So you can keep going and talk about all the different scientific organizations that tell you that, look, this is for real, will you please listen to us? But there are a handful of professional kind of hired gun skeptics. Same thing happened in the early days of smoking and cancer too, where people were out there deliberately trying to confuse people instead of having this be what it should be, a policy debate, instead trying to make it look like it's still a scientific debate. If we could disguise this as a scientific debate, then we don't get to talk about gee, how are we gonna fix the problem? Which might cost a few special interests something. That's what's really going on and we're all getting duped. So that's one myth you should go. Now this is my favorite myth. Um, this one came from a neighbor of mine actually. I was totally blissfully unaware of this in my little bubble in Madison. Um, but one of my neighbors, you know, just a um, great guy, I'll, I'll call him Brian, uh, that's his name. <laughs> he, um, <laughs> he, uh, he's just a regular guy, he drives a pickup, good working class guy, just I love this guy. Very. You know, I grew up in a town like this. We get along great. And he came up to me one day while I was kind of going to work, and he came out and said, hey, John, come here. You know, I'm like, yeah, hey, Brian, what's up? He says, hey, you work down at the university, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do, actually. He said, do you work in environmental stuff, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, actually, I do. I work in this environmental studies thing. And he says, do you do anything on global warming? I'm like, well, yeah, actually, I do. And he, he literally looked up and down the street to make sure we were alone. He really did. And he leaned in and he says, so, uh, can you tell me about the, you know, the big thing? I'm like, what do you mean? What, what are you talking about? You know, the big conspiracy. You can let me in on it. I won't tell anybody, I promise. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? I don't understand. Conspiracy? What, what, did I miss something in the news this morning? What, what, what happened? What's going on? You know, the big conspiracy. You, were, you know, you and scientists and you know, liberal academic types and Greenpeace and the UN and you know, I don't know who else. Um, you know, you're all in the big conspiracy. I'm like, what are you talking about? Said, you, know, uh, you know, the big conspiracy. You're trying to wreck the oil companies and wreck the American economy. I'm like, where did you hear this? And he says, well, you know, from Rush Limbaugh, of course. <laughs> and it's like, and his new friend, uh, Michael Crichton, the guy who uh, came up with Jurassic Park. And this guy's an MD, apparently, but you know, if he's qualified to talk about global warming, then I can do brain surgery, I guess. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, these guys are actually making a living kind of entertaining America, but with very little facts, saying, believe it or not, that there's a vast left-wing eco-conspiracy to wreck the world's economy. And so I kind of looked at my friend Brian and said, Brian, first of all, don't try to guess my politics, you know, because you're wrong. I'm not a left person at all, actually. I come to this from a very different point of view than you might guess. 
But put that aside. Do you honestly think that a bunch of left-wing college professors and Greenpeace members could actually pull off a vast international conspiracy that is outwitting everybody in the world except Rush Limbaugh and George W. Bush? And he kind of looked at me and says, well, damn, you guys couldn't pull it off if you tried. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, Left-wing conspiracy, sorry, that's a contradiction in terms. We couldn't possibly pull it off. So anyway, I mean, this is entertaining, but it's you know, kind of telling that, you know, don't, again, where you get your information from is a really, sorry state of American media right now, I think is something we need to deal with here. Let's just put it that way. Can't confuse information with entertainment. So this is entertaining, but it's not good information. So, well, let's move on a little bit. We can kind of talk about this issue and kind of make fun of it a little bit, but I also want to stress how important this really is. This is a real human dilemma, and it's going to start touching all of our lives very, very soon, if it hasn't already. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, here's one of the things that kind of keeps me up at night. Uh, this is the first look into the future I'm showing you. This is not a current day situation, but this is a computer model. Everything else I showed you before is real data. But this is a computer model asking a simple question. It's kind of washed out in colors, but I'll walk you through it. And it's asking the question, what will farming be like at the end of the century if climate changes uh, happen the way we expect? Well, the bottom line here is all of those red places here in like northern Canada in Siberia and all those places, those are places where the growing season and the current soil conditions would become such that you could actually grow more food there than you do now. You could probably grow wheat up in the boreal forest of Canada. You could clear forest in Siberia and grow wheat up there if you really wanted to. And uh, that you know, would increase food production for those regions. But what you can't see very well, maybe you see this kind of pale blue down here in the Great Plains, a lot of South America, almost all of Africa, a lot of South Asia, particularly India, even Australia. Those are places where food production is going to get a lot harder. And the thing that scares me the most is mainly tropical Africa. You're talking about part of the world where poverty is increasing, the only place in the world where it's still increasing, where life expectancies are decreasing still and shouldn't be. They're now down to about 35 years in much of southern Africa. Food security is already a massive problem for many of the people there, not everyone, but a lot. And we have the problem of HIV and AIDS, and we have problems of you know, inequitable resource consumption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now we're going to throw climate change in their laps, the people who are least equipped to handle it, whereas people in the north, like Canadians, might get a better growing season, but people in Africa get worse. That's really buggered, if you ask me. That's not very good. And it's going to be something that's going to cause some major international tensions. This is a major security issue, not just an environmental issue. So that's a look into the future, and that kind of creeps me out when I think about this. It's very, very scary stuff. But what about right now? Well, a few of us um, did the work on this a couple years ago, and we just published this in Nature about 2005 with the World Health Organization. But we asked kind of a simple question. We said, well, we know in some parts of the world that as temperatures increase, there's a statistically noted increase in the number of people who die. Uh, it's very well known, especially in poor countries, where as temperature goes up, the amount of people who die from diarrhea and waterborne illness goes up too. Also, the number of people who die from malaria goes up. People buy, uh, die from foodborne illnesses because they don't have refrigerators. That goes up. Temperature goes up, deaths go up, especially in poor places. So we asked a question. We said, well, how many people are dying and where are they? Well, this first map shows the polluters of the world in terms of the CO2 pollution, greenhouse gases. The US, obviously, a big one. Europe would be, if we added up all those countries together, you'd have another big red country. The, the deeper the red color, the bigger the polluter it is. But the bottom line is the US, Europe, and China are now the big three polluters of greenhouse gases in the world. China is surprisingly shooting up uh, a lot in the last decade. But of course, they have you know, a quarter of the world's population, so that's pretty normal. But anyway, we see this, and those are the big polluters, and the poor countries generally aren't doing very much. But now we ask the question, who's dying today from climate change? That is, deaths that would not have happened if the temperatures weren't as high as they've gotten. Well, they're all concentrated down here, mainly in Africa, but also spread throughout much of Southern Asia, even Latin America. This is really kind of scary. You might ask, well, how many deaths is that? Is it two, two million? What is it? Well, the number we arrived at, which is a very conservative estimate on the very low end, we think it's much higher, but the lowest possible number it could be is about 150,000 a year. That strikes home to me because I live in Madison, and Madison's about 150,000 people. So it would be something, you know, somebody dropping a nuclear bomb on my hometown, and nobody in the world noticed it. 
and then it happened again next year somewhere else, and then somewhere else, and somewhere else, like a drum. Every year, and we didn't notice. It's 50 times the, you know, what happened to the World Trade Center, as horrible as that was. And yet there's no war on climate change yet. And this is happening to the world's most vulnerable and poorest people who didn't emit anything, who didn't cause any of this pollution. And if anything, this is only going to increase. So this is a very, very serious issue. And this is hard because the people in the most sensitive regions of the world, people who are gonna pay the price the most are people in the Arctic. I'll talk about that a bit more. People live near coral reefs, in tropical rainforests, in small islands. The irony here, of course, is these people emit almost nothing. They're not the biggest polluters. They're the least polluting people on Earth, most part. And this becomes a security issue. We're destabilizing the peoples and governments of vast areas of the world, and maybe alienating them against places like the US or Europe, maybe even China. Do we want to have that right now, have a further tension between North and South, rich and poor, East and West? Do we really want to do that? It's also the idea of you know, destabilizing entire countries and having massive refugee problems like we have in the Sudan today. Do we really want more of that? These are breeding grounds for terror, for other problems, et cetera, and unrest. We do not need that in the 21st century, I don't think. And of course, it's a moral issue, one that, you know, I'm not gonna tell you what the answer to this is, but I hope you'll think about it, because I don't know the answer either. None of us really do. Who is the ultimate moral authority? Well, we all have to have that conversation. It's an equity and ethical issue. You know, do we wanna live in a planet that says it's okay for you to live your lifestyle even though it's killing other people, just so you can kind of drive to the mall in a bigger car than you might really need? I guess that's okay because we're doing it, but I think we had to examine that question a bit more and really think about it and do, so, do whatever we do consciously with real information. So hopefully we'll all think about that a bit more when we make our decisions. So wow, that's pretty bad. Uh, you know, you can see why people like me don't get invited to parties very much, um, <laughs> or never twice. <laughs> and uh, that's sort of, you know, the, uh, that comes with the union card of becoming an environmental scientist is to really bum everybody out. Um, so this is bad. Um, it's actually a lot worse. I'm gonna bring you down a couple more rungs on the ladder for a while, if you don't mind. Um, as serious as the issue of climate change is, it's not the only issue. It's kind of funny, when we think about environmental issues in science or policy, we kind of do it in this funny little test tube way, where in this test tube, the only thing happening on Earth is climate change. And then in somebody else's test tube, oh, and that one, uh, biodiversity is getting lost. And this one, we're overdrafting the world's water supplies. And here we're ruining the world's soils. And over here we're causing all sorts of pollution. Well, the real world isn't that nice and tidy. Everything's happening. A whole bunch of things are happening because we're pushing the planet to its limits and beyond in multiple interacting ways that we do not fully understand. It's pretty serious stuff. Let me consider one other example, just one, besides climate change. If you had to think of two pillars of our civilization, it's how we use energy and how we grow food. Those two things matter a lot. Energy ties to global warming, but modern agriculture or industrialized agriculture is also causing major widespread problems around the world. I'm gonna whip you through a few of them. Uh, these are farms, farms all over the world, taken from a satellite picture of these. Here's farms in Minnesota, not too different than ours. Kansas with those nice center pivot irrigation systems. These are uh, village landscapes in Germany, kind of the old farming villages in Germany. Uh, this is a rainforest in Bolivia where they start in the middle and okay, you get that part of the rainforest and you radiate outward like a clock. In Thailand, those are rice paddies, like rice terraces are going up and down hills. And Brazil, those are uh, soy soybean plantations, massive farms here, bigger than anything I've seen in the US actually, massive. So these are different kinds of farms and they happen all over the world. But the accumulative action of farming around the world is amazing. The agriculture we have done on this planet so far has cleared about 40% of all the land on Earth. If you don't count Greenland and Antarctica, even if you do that, it's still 33%. So 40% of all of the land on Earth has already been cleared for mainly agriculture. You know, when people talk about land use as an environmental problem, they usually mean like Walmart, sprawl, suburbia. Uh-uh, it's agriculture. We use 18 million square kilometers of land to grow crops. That's the area of South America added all together. That's about the size of a South America's worth of farms on Earth. We use 30 million square kilometers, about, that's about the size of Africa, added all together to grow basically cows. Those are the world's pastures and rangelands. And then about an area of the UK, maybe, about five million square kilometers, that's what we have in cities and suburbs. 
So vastly more land is in agriculture and it's cleared a huge amount of the world. This brown area down below, those are the world's crop areas where we grow crops. And here on the right, in the kind of um, yellowish color, yellowish brown color, those are the world's rangelands and pastures. That's 40% of all the ecosystems in the world, already cleared. Well then, after that, we use about 40% of all the biology done on the planet, including the oceans. 40% of all the life energy through photosynthesis that's done on land or ocean goes into the human hands. Before we came along, no other species came close to one-tenth of 1%. 1 now we're all the way to 40. That's amazing, and growing rapidly. That's an extraordinary number, absolutely amazing. So the consequences of this, we just don't even understand yet. Well, land degradation, what about water? Water also is mainly used to grow food. For example, 70% of the water uh, taken out of nature each year goes to irrigating crops. 85% of it, if you don't count what's returned to the watershed. So a large amount of water is going into crops, and it turns out we're using about 50% of all the water in the world that actually flows from the continents into the oceans every year. We're already using 50% of it. And in dry places, we know what that means. Uh, for example, this is a picture, uh, an old um, declassified satellite image now, of what was the Aral Sea, uh, an inland sea in the former Soviet Union, what's now Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Well, you probably heard this story before, but in the 60s, and, uh, basically, well, 50s and 60s, uh, Khrushchev, among others, suggested they divert the two rivers here. You see this little river there and that little river here. Those rivers supplied water from snow melt in the mountains to this inland sea. This is a desert area. There's no rainfall here. So the rivers provided all the water to that inland sea. Well, they diverted the rivers and started irrigating the desert to grow cotton to create a little bit of cash for the Soviet Union. See how well that worked out, huh? Um, so you divert most of the water away from the Aral Sea and the water goes away. Half the Aral Sea is already gone in terms of surface area, two thirds of its volume. 19 of the 20 indigenous fish of this region are now extinct. Weather patterns have changed, it's just massive. And look at the scale here, that little box on the side there, that's 30 kilometers, or uh, 24 miles if you speak American. If you're right here on the edge of what used to be bigger than the Great Lakes, Imagine that's Milwaukee or Kenosha or someplace like that, and then Lake Michigan just went 50 miles that way in 25 years. That's what happened to this place. Pretty amazing, and people did it. That's amazing. Uh, another part of the world where this has happened, this is a place where I've worked in, uh, in Africa called Lake Chad. Um, I won't go through this too much, but this is what Lake Chad used to look like. This is uh, still 30 kilometers or 24 miles on a side. This is a big, big lake. And in the late 60s, there's a natural drought, nothing to do with climate change or global warming or human activities, just a natural drought in Africa, kicked in in the late 60s, and it started to shrink a little bit. But then people started to irrigate their crops and their grazing lands in this part of the Sahel of Africa, which nobody had done before. Usually they moved on, but then now they irrigated. It was so-called you know, improvement of technology. Well, then they took all the remaining water away, and so this is what's left by the late 80s. This little blue area is what's left of that lake. Sand dunes are now in what used to be most of Lake Chad. Extraordinary change here. Um, I can tell you more about this later, maybe after the break. I can tell you why I, uh, well, interesting uh, thing. I got a phone call from the Pentagon when this paper came out. It was very strange, but I'll have to tell you about it later, or I'll have to kill you all. So, <laughs> no, uh, very strange story, but I'll tell you later if you want, offline. Um, so we've used a lot of land, a lot of water, and gosh, we use a lot of chemicals in our farming. Uh, the so-called modern industrial agriculture is absurdly inefficient in terms of chemical use because we don't pay for them. They're basically free. They're very inexpensive. We don't pay for the environmental damages they cause. But one of the things we've done is, believe it or not, the fertilizers used around the world have doubled, more than doubled, in fact, the amount of natural nitrogen and phosphorus that goes into the world's ecosystems. Just farming has doubled the flows of these nutrients compared to all geological history. And we've done it in the last 30 years. So this stuff does not stay put. When farmers put nitrogen and phosphorus on a field, less than a third of it actually goes into the plant, usually. Most of the rest runs off into a lake, into a stream, into groundwater, some into the atmosphere, and it ends up going to places you might not expect. Here, for example, is a map of the upper Midwest. There's Wisconsin, there's where we are right about there. And here's a map showing fertilizer use. The bigger the red color, the bigger the fertilizer use. So being good Wisconsinites, we can just say, well, it's all Illinois, don't worry, <laughs> not us. <laughs> it's those guys down there, you know, the, those fibs down there. So we have the fertilizer map down here, but you know, that stuff doesn't stay put, and it's massive. It's not just a field or two. Look at that massive, big bullseye of miracle Grow getting dumped on North America. Well, that stuff is going somewhere, and it's going down in the Mississippi River. 
and ultimately it pops out here. You recognize Louisiana here? This is a satellite image looking for chlorophyll, looking for plants in the ocean. And it shows this big bloom of plants because of all the miracle Grow we're dumping down the Mississippi River, essentially. So that big bloom of ocean biology, phytoplankton in the oceans. You know, wow, that's huge. Now you might think, well, hey, you environmentalists are crazy. We're just providing nutrients. There's life here. There are plants. That's it, good, right? Um, not quite. What happens, of course, is when these plants grow, they do their thing, but then they die and they settle down in the water column. And as they go down in the water column and the plants start to decay and decompose, it sucks all the oxygen out of the water. And you get this large kind of hypoxic zone, which means free of oxygen. Uh, but they call it the dead zone. It's what fishermen call it. It's a place where you can't find any fish anymore or shrimp. So this is you know, nitrogen fertilizers, farmers growing corn mainly. God, wait until we grow a lot of ethanol up here. This is going to be really scary is a lot of this stuff is dumping down in the Gulf of Mexico, destroying coastal fisheries. And it's not just happening here, it's happening in Europe, in the Black Sea, the North Sea, et cetera, it's happening in China, down every river where it goes into a coastal ocean where there's <laughs> agriculture upstream, you're seeing a degraded ocean ecosystem all over the world. That's Louisiana here, you see that? Kind of zooming into this little place here. So we're kind of zooming in right there. So that's kind of the Atchafalaya, Mississippi Delta region. And those are measurements of where the water is devoid of oxygen. Uh, and it turns out 1999, that's gotten bigger uh, since then. So the point is here is that agriculture is another major force. I mean, it's a good thing. You know, God knows we need food and everything like that. But the consequences of our agriculture are also causing planetary environmental problems now. It's not just a local problem. It's a global problem now. And the scary thing to me is that all of these things, climate change, land degradation, water degradation, nutrient pollution, are all hitting the fan at the same time and doing things we just don't really know what's going to happen. And the thing that's so different about our time uh, and the environmental problems we're talking about now is it's not just confined to a local place. Uh, when we tend to think of you know, 1970s environmental problems, we tend to think about you know, an endangered species, like a spotted owl, for example, or an endangered place like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge or something like that. Now, those things are really important, believe me. But we're talking about problems now that are they're going to make those look trivial by comparison. That you might just say, write off a few endangered species. Don't worry about it. Write off Anwar, because we've got bigger problems. Because we're talking about actually putting whole parts of our entire biosphere not just a little place here and there, entire ecosystems across large regions could literally be on the brink of extinction. Let me show you a couple. Uh, one, of course, is the Arctic. I already showed you how the area is experiencing massive climate change already, warmer than anywhere else in the world in terms of the warming we've seen so far. But also we're seeing big ecological changes up there too. Uh, here's a map of just showing the Alaskan part of the Arctic. What we're seeing is new trees and shrubs marching northward essentially into what used to be tundra. So forests are growing up in what were tundra before. We can see it from, you know, from outer space, actually, now, which is amazing. And in the interior of Alaska, at least here, they're increasing fires. So forests are actually declining somewhat. Well, you might ask the question, well, wait a minute. If I have tundra, which is covered by snow all winter and into the spring a long time, and now we've got big trees growing out of the snow. See, I took a surface that was big and white and reflective that reflected the sun's heat away. And now I just made it dark and green. And now uh, it's absorbing the sun's heat. So it turns out this actually prevent, provides a big kind of feedback on climate change, making these regions even warmer than they would have been. Uh, so we're already seeing kind of a feedback that's accelerating global warming in this region, even on land. All of our projections of climate change don't even take this into account yet, actually. So it's probably going to get warmer than we expect. The point here is, though, the Arctic may very well be at this. This is an overused word. I apologize for it. This kind of tipping point idea that we might get to a point where the Arctic as a frozen tundra-like ecosystem could just literally go away overnight. I mean, at least in geological time. In the next 30 years, you could just forget having the Arctic altogether. So friends of mine work really hard on that little tiny piece of real estate called you know, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I look at them and say, you know, just give it to the Bush administration. Let them have it in exchange for real policy changes on global warming. Because that's going to wipe out the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge no matter what you do. Just write it off. If you don't do something about this bigger problem, protecting that little postage stamp ain't going to matter at all. And they get really mad, mad with me when I say that. But I think that's the reality now. We've got to start looking at the bigger environmental problems as well as the local environmental problems and realize they have to be handled together. If we keep on working on each individual little place, we're going to forget them all in the big scheme of things.
So we have to look at those two scales. Coral reefs, another kind of interesting one. Well, we know that warming oceans are already hitting the coral reefs. When the ocean temperatures go up, they tend to have a disease that leads to coral bleaching. Warmer ocean temperatures leads to, it's a long, complicated story, but it leads to this phenomenon called coral bleaching, where you take kind of a healthy coral and you warm it up, and it actually leads to a disease in the symbiote that lives in the coral itself and kills them. Warmer ocean temperatures is bad for coral. But that's not the only thing happening. Of course, we're hammering the coral reefs anyway from overfishing, even the aquarium trade. They use cyanide to fish for uh, you know, those beautiful fish you get in the aquarium stores. Well, every one of those you see alive in an aquarium store, probably about 50 other fish died to get you that one because they actually use cyanide to stun all the fish, and a lot of them don't make it. So you know, even the aquarium trade's hitting these things, and people you know, doing too much tourism around them, that kind of stuff. But then there's one other one we kind of forgot about, <clears throat> is the fact that carbon dioxide you know, goes in the atmosphere, warms the planet, but a little bit of it is dissolving in the ocean water. And what happens when you put carbon dioxide in water? You make carbonic acid, right? Carbonated water. Carbonated water, carbonic acid, is actually an acid. It's acidic, right? That's why it's called an acid. Well, the oceans are getting slightly more acidic. I mean, the oceans are big, and they're chemically buffered. They're naturally kind of alkaline. But already, the ocean's pH started out about 8.1. We've dropped it to 7.9 already, which doesn't sound like a lot. But when you get to 7.5, which will be at a 2030 at this rate, you can't make calcium carbonate crystals that make the aragonite crystal form that's found in coral reefs. So in 2030, unless we drastically change what we're doing, not a single coral reef on this planet could ever grow again, period. And that's just the chemistry, let alone what we're doing from the warmer temperatures and over-harvesting fish. It's just chemistry. You can't you do it in a lab any day you want. You can't grow aragonite at 7.5 pH. You just can't do it. So this is a big problem. So within our lifetimes, coral reefs on Earth will go extinct, period, unless we drastically start changing some stuff right now. So this is a big triple threat. What about tropical rainforest? I work in this part of the world a lot, right, in the eastern Amazon. We already know that we're deforesting the heck out of these places, right? We're cutting down trees left and right. Well, one of the things that's kind of sad about that is even as we penetrate into the forest, this is a satellite picture kind of seeing how roads are being built into the rainforest. What happens, of course, is you open up the rainforest. The rainforests are amazing. They kind of protect themselves. Even though we call them tropical rainforests, they often have a six or nine month dry season where there's no rain at all in much of the tropics. It shifts around. It doesn't rain every day at all. But a healthy rainforest protects itself. It keeps the litter and the surface moist and keeps it shaded from the sun. It doesn't dry out and become kindling. But you cut open a rainforest and you leave a bunch of dead trees and slash behind and you expose it to the sun and you make a bunch of tinder essentially. And it doesn't take much to start a fire. So everywhere you deforest an area, you even have more fires in the remaining forest besides. You cut down one acre, you might burn down two by accident later. So in terms of the damage to the rainforest, deforestation has two, one, two effect, kind of a double punch there. And then we throw the wild card of climate change at it. We know the tropics are getting warmer, but are they gonna get warmer and wetter or warmer and drier? Until recently, we weren't really sure, and I don't think we're sure yet, but right now the evidence seems to be tipping towards warmer and drier, at least in the Amazon and much of Malaysia and Indonesia. If that's true, then you know, this is devastating. Uh, again, the potential, I'm not declaring this to be true yet, but there's a real potential for massive die-offs of tropical rainforest, again, from this triple threat of deforestation, increased fires, and then, oh yeah, climate change, all pushing the same way, all interacting together could literally have massive die-offs of rainforest. Again, about the you know, lifespan of much of the people in this room. This is pretty serious stuff. So this is kind of scary. We're not, again, we're talking about whole parts of the biosphere, like the entire Arctic, our entire coral reefs, our entire rainforest, literally disappearing for the most part due to these interactive effects of climate change and other things. Very scary stuff, and there are more I didn't get into. These are also interesting places in terms of where people live. It's not just you know, fuzzy nature and stuff like that. There are a lot of important people who live here. I didn't even talk about the small island nations. That's probably pretty obvious. But what about Laplanders and Inuit peoples of the north or indigenous tropical peoples of the rainforest? What do they do to us? You know, why do they deserve to have their ecosystem obliterated and their way of life? It's genocide. No simple word for it other than that. So what do we do about that? Well, these losses become irreversible unless we do something about them now. Now, I get in a little trouble for saying this, but 
you know, I'm not your usual environmentalist. I don't like being called an environmentalist. I'm a scientist who became an environmentalist because of the facts. I'm also very passionate about these issues, but I want some numbers to back me up. I'm a pretty analytical guy. So when environmentalists jump up and down and say, we have to do something now, I ask the hard question, show me data that says we have to do something now versus waiting a little bit. Why right now? So I'm gonna be fair and do that to me. I'm gonna present you some data showing you why we do have to act now on climate change and other issues. Here's the real problem. We're running out of time, and here's a little bit of the science behind that. Okay, I don't wanna give you a lot of science, I know that's boring, but I'll give you a little two, two little nibbles of science tonight. One of them is how long CO2 stays in the atmosphere. See, I drove here today, okay? Um, drove, I drove a little Prius, so it's not so bad. But I used up a couple gallons of gas getting here, and I'll use a couple going home tonight. For every gallon of gas that I burn, or you, or anybody, we're all the same, you can pick up a gallon of gas, you can hold it in your hands. It weighs about seven pounds. You fill up a milk jug of gasoline someday, right? You hold it in your hands, it weighs about seven or eight pounds, a little lighter than water. And when you burn that in your engine and you mix it with air and mix the carbon in that stuff with the oxygen in the atmosphere, it becomes 20 pounds, well, 19.5, about 20 pounds of carbon dioxide gas that goes into the atmosphere. Unbelievable, but the CO2 you burn out of your tailpipe weighs more than the gasoline that went into it because you took a lot of the weight from the air. Anyway, that's an invisible gas that goes up into the atmosphere and we don't see it anymore. That's the big problem because we don't see it anymore. Our former transportation systems, when we rode horses all the time, we could see the waste. That was good. I like that. You know, wouldn't it be cool, a little tangent, but wouldn't it be cool if cars did that too? I would love to see that, like little carbon turds left on the highway. Imagine a Humvee driving by, you see, boom, you know, boom, boom. And then you had to go out and shovel them up and pick them up after yourself. And the little Prius goes by, it's like a little rabbit, you know, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. I think that'd be pretty cool, but uh, I, I've proposed this to a couple auto manufacturers and they just look at me strangely, but. Anyway, uh, I think this idea could catch on. But anyway, we dump CO2 and it goes into the air, and believe it or not, it stays there for 110 years on average. So the carbon dioxide I put in the air today driving up here is gonna be there long after me and my kids are dead. And it's still gonna be around. So the carbon dioxide is a long-lived pollution in the atmosphere, it's not going anywhere, anywhere soon. So that's one problem that conspires against us. The other is it takes a long time for the Earth to warm up. Um, Imagine you're making spaghetti for dinner, right? You get a big pot of water, you turn up the heat, and what, it takes a few minutes, like five, 10 minutes, to kind of catch up to that new heat you added to, right? For the temperature to catch up to the new heat you added to the water. It's called thermal inertia, right? Or heat capacity. Very simple idea. Well, now imagine a pot of water the size of Earth. Earth is basically a big pot of water. It's 71% covered in oceans. The oceans are about three miles deep of water. That's a hell of a lot of water, right? Well, it turns out it takes the Earth about 30 to 50 years to catch up in temperature when you add heat to it. Not five minutes, 30 to 50 years. Think about that for one second. It means the temperatures we're seeing today are just catching up to the pollution levels of about 1967. That's the year I was born in 1968. So my entire lifetime's worth of emissions hasn't even counted yet. That means, believe it or not, if we stopped emitting all greenhouse gases tomorrow, it's a capital crime to drive your car starting tomorrow. You cannot use electricity starting tomorrow. You cannot use any gas, any oil, nothing starting tomorrow. Climate change will continue unabated for at least 30 to 50 years. And there's not a single thing you and I can do about that. It's called physics, can't get around it. That's inertia, massive amount of it. So the climate changes for most of the people in this room, lifetime, has already happened. Nothing you can do about it. What we can do about it, of course, is what happens afterward. We are steering the climate history of the next 300 years, and we're doing it right now. So this is really serious stuff. It's kind of like driving the Titanic or steering the Titanic. You don't wait until you graze the iceberg before you start turning the boat, right? That's kind of the problem they had. If they had a little more warning, acted a little sooner, everything would have been fine. They didn't wait, or they, did, you know, they didn't see it in time. So you can't stop on a dime as something that takes 30 to 50 years to shift with pollution that lasts 110 years. You don't wait. It's already, you've waited too long as it is. That's the problem. We've already waited 50 years too long. That's the problem. We have a narrow window to prevent really catastrophic changes in our climate. For example, if we look at this graph here, this shows possible futures. We get to choose which future happens over the next three to 500 years. People in this room, our generations, 
will decide everything for the next few hundred years. That's a curse and it's a privilege to be that generation, but that's what the cards we were dealt. So right now in that little red circle, that's what's gonna determine what happens. Do we choose that path? Actually the path we're on right now goes up off the ceiling. You can't even measure it. But or we choose one goes down here. All of them lead to more global warming, but how much more? Do we, do we get grazed by the bullet? Do we take it in the shoulder? Or does it nail us right in the center? Those are the choices. And they all get made about 2005 to 2035, the next 20 years or so, roughly. So we have about a decade or two to really get moving on this, if we're lucky. So that's why we have to get moving on this issue. It's very serious, and we've got to move. So are we up to this challenge? Are we up to this? I think we are, but it's going to be really, really hard. We have to go beyond what's politically realistic and do what's scientifically necessary. This is a problem we have as a society. It's kind of funny, don't you think, that you know, somehow we aren't able to talk about you know, politics and economics are somehow fixed and non-negotiable. But eh, the laws of physics, eh, don't worry about that stuff. That's OK. We can ignore those. But we can't have a conversation about how we cost things in an economy or how we take the burden of climate change and sort of pay for it and shift our things in the right direction. That's crazy. Any society that does that is, you know, basically doesn't stay around very long. That's a major problem. What we have to do, basically, is we have about 20 years to stabilize our carbon dioxide emissions and then radically bring them down over the next 100. We have to at least get started in the next 20 years, but then we have to work with future generations to keep the job going. We don't have to do it all at once. We at least just have to get started, that's all. But getting started is often the hardest part. But this is also a huge opportunity. This is the biggest business opportunity in human history. Fossil fuels are now the biggest industry in the planet has ever seen. It's about $2 trillion a year, and we get to reinvent it. That's cool. I mean, that's bigger than Bill Gates' biggest dream times 10. It's huge, and we get to reinvent the world for a better, and we can make a hell of a lot of money doing it if we're lucky and we're smart. Here in Wisconsin, we talk about this a lot, of course, because you know, we spend about 8 to $10 billion a year on energy, and most of that leaves the state because we don't have a lot of energy resources. But we do have renewables. Wind is effective in Wisconsin. Maybe we'll get smart and figure out how to do biofuels right. Uh, Corn-based ethanol probably isn't the way to do it, but there's some other ways. Uh, biodiesel, there are other ways to make ethanol, bioreactors of methane, et cetera, maybe even hydrogen bioreactors from wastewater. There's a whole bunch of people working on energy farms that could actually produce energy here in the Midwest. I think that's an idea worth pursuing. That might be a great business opportunity. It'd be great for our rural, uh, rural communities and farmers if we do it right. So that's something to think about. And we do have the ability to solve this problem. We have it right now. We don't need Star Trek to solve this problem. We can do it today. Here's an example. This is what we're projected to do for our energy use in the US over the next couple decades. This is where we are now. This is how much carbon we burn up and dump in the atmosphere. About 1.8 billion tons of carbon. Imagine a billion and a half uh, tons of charcoal, basically, burned and dumped into the atmosphere. We're projected to increase that. But we don't have to. We could do a few things about that. We could say, well, what if we made electricity a little more efficient? What if we all used Energy Star appliances? What if we used compact fluorescence for our lighting instead? Incandescence, I think, should be banned from the United States. Australia has done this. California is next. California has a bill, by the way. It's great. A uh, legislator calls it the, how many politicians does it take to change a light bulb bill? That's the actual legal name of the bill. <laughs> it really is. Somebody with a sense of humor, thank goodness. But uh, you know, why don't we get more efficient with electricity? And if we just made electricity standards more efficient, not even a German standard, just a little bit better than the US, we could cut that much out of our energy use in the future. That's pretty cool. What about other end use efficiencies, like making buildings a little tighter, a little better insulated, a little bit better in terms of uh, air conditioning in the summer? We could get that purple wedge. What if we make cars at least efficient enough so we could sell them in China? Do you know that China's environmental standards are way higher than ours now for automobiles? People don't realize that, do you? That we have, the, of any country that actually has a standard, we have the lowest on Earth, and then we wonder why American auto, auto manufacturers can't sell cars anywhere. Well, we can't even meet the environmental standards of China today. That's insane. What if we got them up to at least China's, let alone France or something, and we could sell, you know, save all that energy right there, done. What if we had other transportation efficiencies, airplanes, buses, other things that worked a little more efficiently? Get that much more. What if we added some renewables? Not up to Holland standards, just maybe double what we have today, wind and solar. Not very hard. Let's do that. We get all the red stuff. What if we do other uh, technologies? This thing is called carbon capture, 
where we would literally go to power plants and try to capture the carbon dioxide out of the smokestack, liquefy it, and put it below ground. People are working on that. Can't solve all of our problem, but it could solve some of it. That'd be pretty cool. Or biofuels, whatever. You add up what you want. So instead of increasing our energy use, we can cut it in half with 2007 technology. And the economics of this works beautifully. We'll make money doing all of those things. At least we will. Certain companies won't. But American citizens all, on average, benefit from this. It creates jobs, keeps cash at home, improves tax revenue. It's a very good thing for average Americans. Not so good for a couple of special interests, but you can guess who they are. So this is very simple. The thing here, though, is very important to recognize is that there's not a single solution to this problem. None of those alone, conservation alone, unless we got really smart about it, probably isn't quite enough. Renewables alone, probably not going to do it. Biofuels alone, not going to do it. Nuclear power alone, not going to do it. So we don't have silver bullets, but we sure as heck have silver buckshot. We can add them up. We have a very smart uh, bunch of Americans out there who can roll up their sleeves and get a whole bunch of different things working. Let's not bet on one technology. Let's bet on 10. Have them work in parallel, and they would add up. And who knows what we'll come up with. But we could do it today with off-the-shelf technology, just adding up seven different things. We're there. That would work great. And we'll make money doing it. That's pretty cool. So what can we do? What can we do here? You know, if we're not a, an engineer at you know, Boeing or someplace like that, or you're not a scientist working on fuel cells or a policymaker in Washington, what can regular folks like you and me do about this? Well, you know, we can all do our little bit, starting at home. You know, we all should try to do some of this stuff, right? Uh, I started doing this back in the late 90s. I called it my new millennium resolution instead of my New Year's resolution. I didn't get to, you can only get to do one of those probably. So uh, we decided to try to cut our emissions about in half compared to other households in Dane County where we live. And uh, we were able to do that. Uh, actually, we didn't meet our goal. We exceeded it. Uh, we cut our emissions of carbon dioxide, mainly through conservation, uh, by 60 to 70 percent. And it was pretty easy. When we did it, we, well, I'll, I'll, I could tell you about this later. I don't have time. But we basically got rid of our cars. We had two. Now we have one, and it's one of these Priuses. Our car dealer told me, I got the very first Toyota Prius in the state of Wisconsin. And he told that to three other people I've met already. Um, <laughs> And it was on the first truck, that's all I know, it was the big truck, but I don't know which one was really the first, but anyway. Uh, so that was kind of cool, that works pretty well. I walk to work, stuff like that. We all use compact fluorescents, we have a really efficient fridge, we don't use air conditioning, you don't really need it. So that was pretty good, but we were feeling pretty you know, high and mighty about this until I talked to friends of mine from Germany and Sweden. who said, oh, congratulations, you're almost as good as the average German, or the average Swede. I'm like, what, I cut my energy use by 70% and I'm not even at the average Swede yet? Like, no, not yet, you got a ways to go yet. I'm like, my God. So the good news, bad news about being an American is, yeah, we're huge energy pigs, but guess what? Cutting your use in half is very easy. I've not moved into a cave and eating tofu by candlelight. This is a very simple thing to do. And you can live better, save, uh, I'm living better, saving money every single month, and oh yeah, I've cut my CO2 emissions about in half. Cutting it in half again would be hard right now, but doing half is nothing. All of us could do that. Don't listen to Dick Cheney. He hasn't tried. I have. It's easy. You can do it. Not a problem. We also, though, need to move beyond being pessimist about the environment, I think. I think it's time. People are tired of the 1970s environmentalism, I think. Maybe, maybe you disagree. But I think we've got to start speaking positively about the future, about the future we can make, not the future that's laid out for us. There's a future that can be negotiated here. We can change it. So I want to face the future really boldly take it by the horns and do something with it. Make the world better for my kids and yours. I think we all want that. So instead of being bummed out all the time, let's remember the positive. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, um, this sounds like a joke, but it isn't. I, I walked into a bar with a bunch of eco ecologists, a bunch of scientists walk into a bar. And, uh, <clears throat> and the danger of hanging out with people like me, especially if you hang out with like half a dozen of us, is we're going to really bum you out. Because we're sitting there over a couple of beers, one of them said, God, did you hear about the coral reefs? Oh my gosh, did you hear about the butterfly, the bees? You know, the bees are disappearing. What's going on? So a bunch of us were just, you know, this and that, and we're just getting worse and worse and worse until one of our friends literally slams down her beer mug and says, Darn it, roll the dice. We all kind of look at her like, What have you been drinking? You know? And she said, No, no, roll the dice. What other time in human history would you rather be alive? As big as our challenges are now, we have more ability to change the world than any other generation in history. More people today are literate, live in a free and democratic society, though not enough. More people have access to some kind of health care. More people are getting some kind of food and fresh water, though not enough. 
the status of women, status of minority groups, though not good enough, is better than at any other time in history and getting better each year. We're making a lot of progress. This is the best time in, life, in the history of the world to be alive. What other time would you rather be? Some, you know, living as a peasant in feudal times? No, this is a great time to be alive. Stop being so down all the time. So roll the dice. This is a great point in time. We have a lot of tools. Let's use them. The other thing we need to do, besides being very positive about the world, is to remember a very long-term perspective. To solve these problems, we're literally talking about decades and hundreds of years, centuries, thinking into the future. So we gotta take a really long-term uh, perspective and be in league with future generations. Consider them our partners in crime, if you will. Uh, let me tell you one story about this before I start wrapping up. Is, you know, there have been examples where people have had a lot of forethought. A lot of people talk about Native Americans and the, rule, the kind of rules uh, different cultures have about thinking about future generations, like seven generations. You've heard that before, right? Well, here's a story that a lot of people don't know, but I love it. It's about the, the new college at Oxford University, which was built in 1386. That's the new college at Oxford. Well, in the dining hall of the new college at Oxford, there's a vast open dining hall, and in the ceiling there are really big timbers, so you just can't even put your arms around these huge beams up in the ceiling that are oak. Unbelievable. Well, in the last century, I mean, these were built in the 14th century. In the 20th century, people started to notice, wait a minute, there's insect damage and the rot, and those beams are becoming structurally unsound, and they started to have to think about replacing them. But clearly, you're not gonna find trees that big anywhere in the world anymore. They're all gone. So what are you gonna do? They were talking about building steel beams and then covering them with kind of fake wood, like a veneer, or you know, oak members cut into veneer to make it look like a big beam. So they were thinking about this, thinking about this, and somebody had the good idea. And saying, well, you know what? Um, I read somewhere that Oxford has its own forest, and they have a university forester somewhere else in England. Maybe we should write to that guy and see if he has any suggestions about how we can simulate the kind of oak grain that's in this wood as we make this kind of fake beam. So they wrote to the Oxford Forester and he wrote back and says, what are you talking about? Your trees are ready now. And they wrote back like, what are you talking about? They said, well, my predecessor back in the 14th century planted trees knowing that about 600 years later you'd probably need some and that's how long it takes them to grow. So we kind of figure by about now you're probably due because I bet they're getting insect damage and rot, right? Now, while we've been growing your replacements, they're ready now, You're, the parts are in. You know? <laughs> and uh, they're, you know, they're flabbergasted and like, you've been growing them for 600 years? What? Well, yeah, isn't that what we should have been doing? You know, great, and fortunately, well, at least what I've heard, though I haven't seen it, they planted trees again, waiting for the 26th century. It's like, oh yeah, next renovation, we'll have some ready for you. Just wait a little bit, they're back ordered. <laughs> so, you know, hey, that isn't bad. So this is the kind of thinking we need a little bit more of, don't you think? Really long-term thinking, and I think you know, 600 years, that isn't enough, but at least that's encouraging. That's a good start. Well, at the same time, and as a scientist and just a regular citizen, I have no right to tell you this kind of stuff, but maybe we all kind of also need to look a little bit at our own internal moral compass when we look at these issues. They touch upon kind of who we are and kind of the world we want to live in in very deep ways, so we should kind of check in with ourselves every so often and see what our moral compass says about these issues, and don't just listen to other people's. So a lot of people will tell you, environmental folks and people like me will tell you, well, think about future generations. To me, that's a little bit abstract, so uh, one day I, I decided I wanted to see future generations. I want to know what they look like. I kind of think of these people as my clients. So I like to have a picture of my client. I want to know who I'm working for every day. Well, this is who I'm working for every day, are these people. It's people from Sydney, Santiago, Rio, Amsterdam, Hong Kong, et cetera. I could put up a couple hundred of these. These are beautiful people, aren't they? They look like models. They should be in magazines and stuff, right? The interesting thing about these pictures is none of these people exist on Earth. What happened is a guy from the Face of Tomorrow project went around the world with a, just one guy, went around with a digital camera and took pictures of hundreds and hundreds of people on the street, of Sydney, of Amsterdam, of Santiago, and then he brought them home and he brought a computer program to, that actually mosaic them, kind of ensembled them into a single emergent face. So this is literally what you know, all of people of Hong Kong look like, added together. Hmm? Oh, you did, okay, wonderful. So you already know about this, okay. I shouldn't even be telling you this. So I just thought this was beautiful and this is kind of, you know, to me, the best facsimile of what future generations may actually look like. So to me, I have a few of these on my desk and I think of this as sort of like, yeah, you know, these are my clients. So just make this a little more personal and less abstract and kind of remember what we're working for after all. So that's cool. So to me, and I think the science, but also the morality of this argues in some way or another that this is a defining moment, both scientifically, but also politically and morally, 
that we are having the privilege but also the curse of being called upon to act for the future. What we do now won't just determine our lives, but those for centuries to come. And that's just the card we were dealt. We have to deal with it. So the question is, what are choices? Are we going to be who we are so far, or could we be the people we could be, the people we're capable of becoming? That's my hope. Or the difference between the world that is now and the world that could be, and maybe should be. There's a big gap between those, but I think we can cross that. So finally, I'm just going to wrap up with one last thing. Um, it's very hard to close a talk like this, so I can't do it. So I'm going to borrow a quote from a, a really wonderful writer, uh, Barbara Kingsolver. A lot of you probably read her books. In one of her books, she had a character say the following. And I think, to me, this sums up the whole idea of sustainability beautifully. And I'll just read it to you in closing. She wrote, here's what I've decided. The very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for. What I want is so simple I almost can't say it. Elementary kindness. Enough to eat, enough to go around, the possibility that kids might one day grow up to neither be the destroyers nor the destroyed. That's about it. So with that, I'll stop. And thanks very much for your time. And I'll take some questions or comments you have. And thanks so much for having me up here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and I'm happy that you ended with uh, positive notions. Although I, I, you know, I'm still skeptical. And I, don't, I think a lot of times it will, it will take something like a crisis, like an oil crisis, for the United States to be jolted into some sort of realistic action. You proposed solutions like changing fluorescent light bulbs, but mm -hmm. the solutions are really individualized things. And so if we don't have a specific you know, consciousness which is empathetic towards our planet and the crisis that we're facing, mm -hmm. uh, it really seems minimal. Yep. What sort of big policy change is there that you would suggest that we push? Because it seems we need a major infrastructural change in our country and other major oil-consuming nations. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, um, you know, changing the occasional light bulb isn't going to do anything. But if we start to, um, well, one thing, I mean, I'm just bewildered by current politicians who do not seem to understand that the multiple benefits of a different energy strategy in terms of national security, in terms of our economy, and you know, human health immediately because of air pollution, especially from burning coal, then, oh, yeah, at the end of the day, maybe you could do something about climate change. But forget that. Do it for security and economic reasons first. Um, it, it's kind of telling to me that, you know, even though this is so plainly obvious to all of us uh, and it would benefit 99.9% .9 of Americans, we still do just the opposite. We still subsidize the oil and gas industry for oil and gas exploration 10 times more than we've ever invested in renewable technology R&D. That's wrong. That's stupid, bad policy. And there's no question about it. It's not politics. It's just not rational. Uh, there's also, you know, the fact that we, you know, really don't pay right, you know, uh, the right amount for our oil and so on. We don't, the externalities of the environment and health are not accounted for. If you had to pay for, you know, military adventures related to oil with your gasoline, it would cost a bit more. Obviously, the economics are being buggered, you know, deliberately so that it looks like oil is cheap when it's really not. We're paying a lot more for it in hidden ways. So those are things that, you know, in the abstract make a lot of sense. I think immediately, though, um, I'm not very, I don't know, I hope there's no representatives in this room, um, but I'm not that... I don't know, I hate to say optimistic, but I'm not very optimistic Washington's going to lead us out of this crisis. Um, I think it's going to happen in small towns. I think it's going to happen in corporate boardrooms. I think it's going to happen through organizations that are more local. And it is happening. Half the United States right now, even though the federal government won't even talk about it, half the United States is following the Kyoto Protocols right now. Ca um, I'm sorry, California now has probably the most aggressive climate change policies on the books of any nation state in the world. It's by itself, if we're a separate country, it's the seventh largest economy on Earth. It's bigger than France in terms of economic activity. That's a pretty big deal. So the nation, you know, the nation as a whole, yeah, we're kind of stuck there, unfortunately, but we're not just so homogeneous. 
There's a lot going on. There's a lot of cap and trade kind of policies being put forward. Wisconsin's putting forward one this year. Spencer Black, Mark Miller, and others are pushing this right now. Um, I think this is also gaining a lot of bipartisan support. I mean, the, big, the best leaders in climate change right now have been guys with R's after their name, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, John McCain, well, Joe Lieberman, well, okay, I don't know what he is exactly, but um, independent, I guess. Uh, but, you know, it's definitely, you know, it shouldn't be a left versus right issue. It's, it's everybody's issue. And so I agree with you. Some policy initiatives need to happen, but actually I'm more hopeful that, you know, Walmart will do something than I am Congress or, you know, British Petroleum and others. You know, I think those guys will do more in the long run than what we can do relying on the formal policy process. But I'm hopeful they all catch up later. Yeah. Yes, um, two things. One, uh -huh. um, there's a lot of people that feel passionately about the things that you have spoken about tonight, and the whole big picture, not just climate change, all the rest of it. Uh -huh. There's also a lot of people that have pretty large estates, a uh, million dollars or more, sure. quite a few in this country. And if our government, as you were just saying, is probably not very likely to respond in a reasonable way, how would you propose that people with reasonably good-sized estates that they would be willing to part maybe half of it with you know, a really good cause versus all of it going to their children, uh, let's say, um, you know, uh, some of that could be devoted to a particular cause, the Warren Buffetts and the, uh, and, you know, everyone else that's really rich uh, aside. They, they're important, too, and they can do a lot of good with the amount of wealth they have. But yeah. there's a tremendous number of people, well over a million, I believe, in this country with a, that are millionaires. And so what could be done uh, the most productive with those kind of estates to solve this big picture? I spent a fair amount of time talking to millionaires trying to leave some of their money to me uh, for our uh, research projects, in fact. Um, but, uh, Other than your research uh, yeah, projects. Darn. Uh, besides that really good cause. Uh, no, all kidding aside. Uh, well, that's a difficult question for somebody like me to answer. I mean, that's a bigger question than, than I can wrap my head around. But, but yeah, I mean, the number of millionaires, I mean, it's not that hard to become a millionaire now, you know, because it's not worth what it used to be. Um, you know, believe it, I mean, to be honest, you know, it's upper middle class people can maybe get there and if they save well and they invest well, it's possible. So, you know, if you can invoke a kind of more civic mindedness toward this issue, um, that's kind of, I think it leads to a different issue is that, you know, we tend to, um, just, you know, just as a regular citizen, I'm not an expert on this, but just as somebody who's just kind of watching the news, just like you and me, um, it seems remarkable to me that we've kind of abdicated, our, our political spectrum seems to have two solutions. The left thinks government is the solution to every problem sometimes, not everybody, but you know, it seems to be that caricature. And the far right thinks business is the solution to everything. There used to be something in the middle called civil society that used to do things like the you know, old Chautauqua movement or you know, um, well nowadays faith-based groups I suppose. But you know, what happened there? And what about you know, small towns and other organizations? What about civic mindedness? What about giving back to your community? What about the old American dream? save hard, you know, you know, work hard, save your money, think of future generations, invest well, but also support things like education, supporting the environment, supporting people worse off than you. And maybe we've lost a bit of that and hopefully we can gain it back. And I, I admire people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and others who really are literally giving away all their fortune. That's fantastic, we just need more yeah. of them. The second question is easier perhaps for you, <laughs> not so nebulous. Uh, on April 14th this year, 1,300 communities across the yeah. country came together and called for a 2% reduction. I know this is not your entire picture, but at least as far as the global warming climate change part is yeah. concerned. Yeah. And uh, the reason they called for a 2% reduction per year over a 40-year time span is to try to reach 80% reductions by 2050. Yeah. Um, I would like to have your comments on uh, that. Is that a fast enough reduction in yep. your opinion? Or uh, I think the reasoning was if we go faster than that or we try to do a big chunk quickly, it'll scare a lot of people off and they'll give up, throw their hands in the air and, and say it's futile. Why even try? Uh, in fact, that approach, I'm on the uh, Governor Doyle's task force on global warming and that's the approach we're going to take with working with industry is saying, yeah, we're just talking about like 1% this year, maybe two. That's all, and let's talk next year, maybe another one or two percent, and then come back. You know, that compound interest starts to add up. In fact, two percent a year. But the, the sad thing about that is, and this is Bill McKibben's idea, actually, and he was just here yeah. last week. Um, you know, he called for that, but what we're really going to do this year is probably increase energy output probably four percent. 
So there's a 6% gap between reduction where it, we're, we're going in the opposite direction twice as fast. I think it's supposed to start in 2010. It yeah. takes a couple years to get rolling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're, I mean, let's put it this way. If you're um, on a train and you're in uh, New York City and you're on a train heading to Washington, but you really want to go to Boston, the first thing you want to do is slow down the train because it's going in the wrong direction. You know what I mean? So that's what we know. <laughs> you're speeding in the wrong direction, slow down and uh, get in the other direction as quick as you can. That's where we're at, though. We are not just even close to making that goal. We're increasing the wrong direction every year. Oh, yes, gentlemen, that's a question. You mentioned in your presentation the massive infrastructure that we've developed in this world. Yeah. And of course, we all know what that huge infrastructure is. But we're now seemingly on another path to develop another infrastructure. And every time you turn around, we have another corn-based ethanol plant uh, being constructed yeah. uh, on the drawing boards. And uh, projections are that the uh, production of corn actually, or the use of corn in the massive amounts that seems to be uh, being proposed is going to have other negative effects on yes. the world food supply and et cetera. Yep. Um, could you comment on that, please? I know, I know this is only one uh, element, but could you comment no, on that? No, it's this a huge one, yeah. Um, well, so a question about corn ethanol. Um, well, I'm kind of agnostic about corn ethanol, I guess. Um, I, I know there are very strong proponents and opponents on either side, but I guess I'll just raise the question that I think you already are by saying, well, first of all, for every gallon of ethanol that you produce in the U.S., optimistically, it took about a gallon of gasoline to make it. Roughly, for every unit of energy you put into growing ethanol with all the fertilizers, all the machinery, et cetera, you get about 1.1 units of energy out, if you're lucky and everything goes well. That's not very good investment. Biodiesel, on the other hand, growing canola, rapeseed oil, for example, or um, soybeans, for every unit of energy you put in, you could probably get about four units of energy out. So if you're going to do biofuels in the Midwest, I would be much more in favor of soybeans, which after all don't use much fertilizer, and you can get about fourfold improvement thermodynamically. And there's a lot of diesel used in America. We could use it in our trucks or school buses, et cetera. And there's, you know, we, wouldn't make, we could make a big dent in diesel fuel consumption in the U.S. in a carbon neutral way. So I think this corn ethanol thing doesn't make much sense. Now some of my friends who work on the corn ethanol say, well, wait, wait, we're just getting started because we're going to eventually, we're just using the starch and sugary part of the corn right now, but later we can use all that tough lignin and cellulose stuff, the cellulosic ethanol. But then I look at them like, you want cellulose? I can point a lot of cellulose out to you. It's called like poplar trees, willows, uh, waste from paper mills, switchgrass. Yeah, you don't need to grow corn, which requires all this chemicals and fertile. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Now I know why you're doing it. Ah, right. So, you know, the, the real reason, I mean, the elephant in the room, of course, is this is a huge pork thing to agribusiness. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. And let's stop pretending that it isn't, because it doesn't make sense scientifically, thermodynamically, from a policy point of view. It's propping up one or two agribusiness sectors, and that's it. I think we do. Uh, yeah, but if you want cellulose, there's a hell of a lot of other ways to grow cellulose that don't use as much uh, fertilizers and cause water quality problems. You want cellulose, I can give you lots of cellulose without corn. And it wouldn't cost as much. So I'm actually pretty bullish on biofuels in general, but I think we need smart biofuels that don't have the, you know, the inefficiencies of current corn systems. I'd like to learn more about that, but I, I'm kind of skeptical about the corn systems. But I think there are a lot of other systems. You can grow canola. You can grow soybeans. If you want to do, you know, help farmers in the state, that would be great. Bump up the price of soy, good. Um, but also switchgrass, you know, wood products, stuff like that. It wouldn't be enough, but you could get some. And so that, combined with very aggressive conservation of our uh, gasoline resources, could make a big dent. Um, but if we did it right, but right now I'm afraid it's not going in the right direction, personally. Um, but we'll see. We're, we're this year alone, we're going to plant 12 million more acres just in corn in the United States, according to the USDA, probably more. That's uh, twice the size of the state of Maryland, to put it in perspective. Just an acreage in corn. It's the single largest change in American agriculture in one year in our nation's history in 2007. It's probably, probably, you remember that picture of the Gulf of Mexico? We estimate it's going to dump an additional 25% more fertilizer into the Gulf of Mexico this year alone, if that happens, depending on the weather conditions. We don't, on a normal year. So we'll see. But I'm a little worried about that. 
Yeah. Uh, I want to commend you for uh, the extent to which you were able to bring some moral and ethical considerations to bear on the scientific facts. And I'm just kind of curious in terms of the center and whether or not you work with people from other disciplines in the humanities and social sciences uh, at Madison or nationally in terms yeah. of bringing multiple disciplines to bear on the questions? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, so, you know, first and foremost, yeah, that's a really important thing to do. If all we're doing is talking to ourselves, we're not doing any good. And university professors are really good at doing that, as you know. <laughs> uh, we love to talk to ourselves. Um, so we get to break down these disciplinary boundaries, and so we're working pretty hard to, uh, especially in our graduate programs, to really help students break the barriers between science and policy and practice. But that's the, I think that's the missing link. You know, we can do a lot of talk between kind of, you know, hard science folks, social scientists, humanists, that's important. But if we don't get out there in the real world and talk to people who, you know, build engines for a living and who farm for a living and kind of run small towns for a living, that kind of stuff, then we're not getting anywhere. We're still inside the ivory tower. So I think we're getting pretty good at the kind of interdisciplinary scholar side of this. But we also need kind of the equivalent of like a, um, we don't just need a bunch of biologists, we need the equivalent of doctors. What is the sustainability doctor going to be like, the sustainability practitioner? You, know, you wouldn't want a physicist to build you a bridge, would you? You wouldn't want a biologist to diagnose your kid. You want the kind of practical nuts and bolts people just as much as you want the academics and the, the, the you know, talking head guys on TV. So I'm not figure, I've got to figure out who those people are. I think that's important. And we haven't, as educa educators and as educational organizations, we haven't figured out how to train those people yet. And we better do it in a hurry. We're 50 years too late already. Okay, oops, one more. What are your thoughts about recycling glass and plastic? Um, do it. <laughs> um, but, well, I mean, as you've probably heard, I don't know if this is behind your question. Um, you know, that, that's a useful thing to do. We should all do that. It helps our landfills. There's definitely some important things to do. But by far and away, the biggest environmental impacts you and I ever have are threefold. It's basically how big is your family? How do you get to work? And what do you eat? All the recycling in the world is going to amount to 1% of all that stuff. So recycling, great, do it. It's, but it's in the 1% or less range of what we really need to be doing. Um, it's, it's great. It feels good. It's useful for your, you know. But I, I would give up all the recycling in the world if it made people drive more efficient cars. That would be fine with me. I mean, you can make cars out of spotted owls for all I care if they get better mileage. Uh, did I just say that? I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> This is being recorded, right? Oh, God. <laughs> I'm being facetious. I don't really mean that. But I mean, sometimes we um, kind of come up with environmental symbolism, like recycling, which is important. But the elephant in the room is energy use and agriculture and population. These are all the big, big issues. And we're kind of, we sometimes get trapped dancing around the edge, like, oh, look, I can do something about that, about you know, how big my landfills get. We, got, we could get more landfill space. That's a big problem, but not as big as some of these other ones. So I don't know. I think, you know, that's the mouse. Where's the elephant? You know, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't mean to be a little recycling. I do it. We all do it. But that's just the beginning of what we should be doing. Let's do more. And I didn't mean that about the spotted owls. It's just kidding. But I mean, I just sometimes we look at a symbol more than we look at like, whoa, you know, we're missing the big picture sometimes. So we got to look at both of those. I probably just made a lot of people angry. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Any one last qu or I don't know how long you want me to go here. So. Okay, one more question? Question right here for you. Oh, okay, great. I didn't see you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we talked about, you talked about um, a more community-based, uh, what we can do. Yeah. And I'm sure many people in here have already, you know, changed the compact bulbs. We've lowered our carbon emissions, lowered the thermostat. What is the next step? What can we do now? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, that's pretty contextually dependent on, like, how you live and where you live and this kind of thing. But, um... A lot of the things we, you know, people can do, I mean, especially in Wisconsin, I mean, it, you know, are probably related to transportation and heating. Uh, we don't use a lot of, I mean, you could do, electricity is relatively easy to help work on. Um, one, stop using air conditioning if you can, uh, or use as little as possible. Uh, if you work in an office building, why does it, your office building have to be colder in the summer than it is in the winter? Have you ever noticed that? Like, buildings seem like they're 60 in the summer. And like, what, what on earth, you know? But in the winter, like, oh, it's okay. You know, we heat them more. Than, I mean, reverse that. Let it be a little chilly in the winter and a little warmer in the summer. We can adapt to that. And it actually makes you sick when you have to go inside and outside all the time from air conditioning. So, you know, talk to, your, talk to the guys that run your buildings. You know what I mean? Like, talk to the physical. This is a huge problem. I and mean, it's a bit of a tangent, but, you know, sometimes 
when we talk about like energy efficiency in buildings, we talk to the architects, the big contractors, the funders, and we don't talk to the guy who changes the light bulb, the facilities manager, the janitors. These are the people who really make things work. The most powerful person in your building is the guy who's the, the key to the thermostat, okay? The person empties your trash and it can mess with your thermostat. Those are the most important people. And let's make sure they're in on this on day one. Otherwise, you're doomed. So that's something I think you could do is a lot of stuff like that. It depends if you mean in your home or your building, but uh, I guess I would also say um, in homes, one of the big, best investments you can probably do is get a home energy audit where they can do, look for air infiltration, putting these big blower fans in your door and actually depressurizing your house and look for all the little air leaks. And you know, caulk is cheap, uh, so you can go get a couple of tubes of caulk at Menards or Home Depot and just go for it. That'll do more than all the fancy windows and insulation right there for about 10 bucks. So do that, and lots of stuff like this. Again, you know, our family did something pretty easy, cut our CO2 emissions about 50 to 70%, depending on how you look at it. Wasn't hard at all. Okay, now this is the last question. This okay. really isn't a question. This, <laughs> okay. I don't mean to take too much of your time. No, no. This is more of a statement. Your um, and it fits right in with the question that was just asked is what yeah, we you can bet. do. Um, you, you mentioned individually, and, and the idea of doing something locally is what a small group of community members have been working on here in Wausau yeah. um, since January. Oh, and uh, I'd like to invite anybody who's interested in joining this group to um, meet next Tuesday. 4 o'clock at La Prima Deli down on 3rd. Um, we'd invite all of you, whatever your age is, young or old, to uh, come and join this group. I think we're ready to move on and try to do something here in the community uh, to make a difference. And uh, so you're all invited. If you want a, more information on it, just stop over. Brian, raise your hand, Brian. Brian's here. My name's Scott. Just stop by and ask us for more information. Sorry to take the time. No, that's great. I mean, that's fantastic. Good for you. That's fantastic. There will be a reception right after this in the Paris room, which is just around the corner. And um, just give a round of applause. Thanks very much. Thanks.